<clears throat> so good morning and uh, welcome to the 32nd meeting this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item, I remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. However, you may notice that some committee members consulting tablets during the meeting. This is because it provides meeting papers in digital format and for the formulation of questions, etc. Um, the agenda item one is a decision uh, on taking matters in private. First item today is for the committee to decide whether consideration of item four should be taken in private. Uh, the committee will also decide whether to take its consideration of the committee's report in part four of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill in private at future meetings. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, so these will be dealt with in private. We move forward to agenda item two, which is on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill, and uh, we will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary today. Good morning, uh, Richard. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Dave Thompson, Head of uh, <coughs> Land Reform Policy Team in the Scottish Government. And I refer members to the paper. Um, do you have an opening uh, statement or do you? Sure, I can say a few very brief remarks. Well, that would be helpful, yes. Um, and so first carry of all, on, Richard. Yeah. First of all, let me just say good morning to the committee after Thank my you. appearance last week. Uh, and can I take the opportunity to welcome Michael Russell to the committee in particular, who I see a, a new face here today. Uh, and also, I'd like to pass on Dr. Ailey McLeod's apologies. Uh, she cannot be here for this meeting today. Otherwise, um, it would have not been me, it would have been her. But she's, of course, at the climate change talks uh, in Peru. So I'm stepping into the breach yeah, on this important issue. I realise you're on quite a, a tight schedule. I also appreciate the chance to have a discussion with you today and try and give evidence uh, on what is a very important bill. Uh, land reform as a whole is, of course, undergoing a huge change with recent announcements on a new land reform bill the extension of the Scottish Land Fund and our continuing commitment to have a million acres of land in community ownership by 2020. That is a target that will come closer to reality with, with the introduction of this particular bill we're discussing today. Because of the extension of the right to buy into urban areas, which of course means that communities across Scotland will have an equal right to take control of assets that will empower their own community. And by tackling the blight of abandoned or neglected land, we're also going to remove one of the obvious barriers to sustainable development in many of our communities as well. And the community need to not wait for it to come into the for, for that land to come onto the market, but of course they can force a sale without a willing seller. Using the last 10 years' experience of using the Land Reform Act, we will make the Act easier to use and give communities, communities greater flexibility in how they use the Act. The bill as a whole creates new rights for community bodies and new duties in public authorities, providing a legal framework that will promote and encourage community empowerment and participation. The bill aims to support approaches that can contribute to improving outcomes in all aspects of people's lives and can contribute to this growing sense of democratic renewal and change in our country. Of course, there will continue to be discussions with our stakeholders, and today I welcome any suggestions from the committee that would help improve part four of the bill. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first questions from Graham Day. Yeah, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the committee has taken some uh, limited evidence that part four of the bill could have sat within the forthcoming land reform uh, legislation, legislation rather than in this broader bill. I just wonder if you could advise us uh, why it was felt that this was the appropriate vehicle for the part four provisions. As I said in my introductory remarks, Scotland is now embarking on a programme of land reform. So there are various vehicles at the moment which the government have brought forward are going to, or are going to bring forward. We have the Land Reform Bill, which I referred to in my opening remarks. We have the Community Permit Bill, which we're discussing today. I am undertaking the Agricultural Holdings Review as well, which relates to tenant farming and how we're using our land for, for tenant farming and agriculture. And we have ongoing activity over and above that that was already in, in train. And of course, we have the, the Land Fund, uh, which has been boosted uh, from 2016 onwards. So I look at this as a process of land reform in Scotland. I look at it as a wide programme of various elements of activity. Therefore, at the time of the Community Empowerment Bill, we wanted to use that vehicle to do things quickly, uh, because clearly at that point in time, we had the Land Reform Review Group doing its work, and we were awaiting its recommendations, of which we now have 62 recommendations. So that's why it's a programme of land reform that's underway in Scotland just now. And I note that 
many of our, our stakeholders, I think, are quite content with the fact we're using the Community Impairment mm -hmm. Bill to fix some things that need fixed in terms of the Land Reform Act 2003. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, uh, question two on... Uh, Andrew good morning, Cabinet <coughs> Secretary. Um, in all the evidence we've taken, we, we've asked the, the panels um, whether or not, uh, about the policy memorandum that, that, that accompanied the, the, these proposals. And, and generally speaking, people have been reasonably satisfied with the level of information that was provided within it, although, as I suspect you're aware, the Local Government and Regeneration Committee had some concerns about that uh, information um, and indeed wrote to, to you or wrote to the Minister about it previously. And the fact is that the, uh, the policy memorandum devotes less than three pages to the whole of Part 4 and, and brings down 20... Uh, it summarises 20 sections in seven bullet points, which seems a remarkably um, um, robust piece of preceding, if I could put it that way. Um, last week, two of the witnesses um, that we had in front of us raised questions about the, 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 the information they felt they'd got and whether they felt it was enough. And um, One said, I'm not sure that we've had enough information. I've come to the conclusion, having discussed elements of the bill, that we have different people saying that provisions mean different things, and that means somewhere along the line, the explanatory notes and policy memorandum are not providing enough information. So my question to you is, is how do you think it's, how best do you achieve a balance between um, encouraging public dialogue and participation and providing clear uh, and sufficiently detailed information? And do you, do you think, are you, are you satisfied that the policy memorandum provided enough information within it to fully explain the purpose and policy choices that lie within the bill. Clearly, the government always faces a challenge when we're publishing our policy memorandums because the objective is to give the message as to what the government's trying to achieve and its policy objectives. And you want to be relatively high level and broad when you're doing that so people understand that the thrust of, of what you're doing with your legislation and what you're trying to achieve. If you publish a document of many, many pages of detail, perhaps the, the message gets lost in terms of the, the policy objectives. So I think it is, it's always a balance that government you know, has to struggle to, to, to achieve. Uh, again, I, I look at some of the feedback from the stakeholders. They seem quite content. They understand the objectives of the bill. They feel that we have given a succinct explanation of the policy objectives. And clearly, in terms of part four of this bill and that part of the memorandum, extending the right to buy to urban communities is one of the headlines and policy objectives uh, of that part of the bill. Uh, and of course, uh, the right to buy land that's subject to neglect or abandonment uh, clearly is another headline policy objective. So these are transformational in many ways. And I think you just have to strike that balance. I'm not getting into too much detail, but trying to get the policy objectives across. I, th I think the point that really came out last week was that, 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 that those who are used to dealing with legislation were happy with the information provided, whereas some of those who perhaps don't do it on a day-to-day -day basis <coughs> perhaps found some of it quite confusing and, and uh, were looking for further information. But I'd merely leave that uh, uh, as a thought. Yeah. Um, during last week's evidence, we had some very interesting um, uh, statements from Professor Alan Miller, the uh, chair of the, the Human Rights Commissioner. Um, and one of the things he said that he didn't feel that human rights had been brought into the wider context of this bill enough. And, and I, I thought he made some, uh, some very interesting statements on, on how, if we concentrated on the wider aspects of the human rights part of, of, of the legislation, um, he, he felt the whole, thing, the whole debate had become a bit narrow and could have been much wider focused. And I just um, wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on, on to what extent it's the role of the policy memorandum to, to stimulate debate on wider in issues such as ECHR, particularly given the prominence in the land reform review groups to ECHR issues. <clears throat> Clearly, the EC ECHR issues have very much featured in our thinking about what proposals we're able to bring forward as part of the Community Impairment Bill and will heavily feature in, in what we bring forward uh, as part of the, the Land Reform Bill once the consultation uh, for that is complete. Uh, there are many legal considerations we have to take into account as we strike a balance between property rights and the public interest. But I think in terms of the ambitious proposals we are bringing forward as part of this bill and will bring forward as part of the Land Reform Bill, show that we are giving prominence to the public interest, 
which, of course, you are able to promote under human rights legislation. But as you move through the process of legislating on land reform, you constantly have to strike that balance between the property rights and the public interest. ECHR is a debate that applies to many policy objectives and legislation that comes from government, not just land reform. Uh, so the policy memorandum, of course, has to allude to that, but I don't think it's, it's uh, the purpose of it. I think you have to get across your policy objectives, but they have to be in the context of ECHR. But, you know, I reflect on the, the, the points that Professor Miller and others make on this. Can I just make a final point on, on, on that issue, convener? Thank you, and thank you for that um, response. The, 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 the phrase that um, Alan Miller used that could really sort of struck me as being really quite important if I may quote, was if human rights is seen in the wider context that I've set out, there will be a realisation uh, that it drives us not towards courts and lawyers, but towards having an environment in which there is a more constructive dialogue between landowners and communities. And I, I hope you would agree that that is a much more desirable outcome than the, the potential division and angst that, that, that is being aired in some quarters and possibility of, of more confrontational aspects. Well, would, you, would you agree that it is worth looking at those wider aspects in order to achieve a greater degree of, of, um, of dialogue in this whole process? Yes, I do agree, and I do have sympathy for his comments. And clearly, Scotland is now embarking more than ever before on a debate over land reform in this country, and there's going to be a lot of radical measures coming forward, or are already forward as part of this bill, for instance. Therefore, as part of the wider debate over how we own and manage land in this country, clearly human rights are a central part of that debate. And what I'm keen to see, as I'm sure many members of the committee and across Scotland are, is that we are talking about the rights of communities and the public interest as much as the rights of property owners. There is a balance to be struck, and clearly, as we bring forward legislative proposals, we have to strike that balance. But I think it's part of the land reform debate, and land in this country, as I said, how it's used and owned, etc., we have to have at the forefront of our minds the rights of communities the rights of the wider public interest, as much as the rights of landowners or property owners. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I suspect there are one or two aspects of that we might come back to later, but thank you very much. Um, I, I take it that the Cabinet Secretary's team is aware of the evidence given by Malcolm Coombe, uh, who's done work in South Africa, about Article 11 of the UN International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, mm -hmm. which guarantees certain rights such as sanitation, food and housing, uh, and therefore that uh, any question of Scottish legislation uh, that is, might be seen in breach of ECHR could well actually um, have reference to this other uh, wider uh, uh, set of uh, guidance from the United Nations. Yes, and I, th I think that just reinforces what I've just said in terms of we have to take into account human rights for everyone in the society, not just landowners and property owners, which sometimes is the, the safe option for uh, legislators. So we have to just strike that balance. Indeed. Right to financial memorandum. Jim Hume. Uh, convener and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, just going on to the financial memorandum, the financial me memorandum states that the uh, uh, there shouldn't be any significant additional cost on the Scottish Government regarding this, uh, uh, this bill going forward and that all additional costs would be met from existing resources. But it also goes to, on to state that there's a large degree of uncertainty on the level of costs for communities and, and landowners, of course. So I would just be interested in the Cabinet Secretary's views on what costs he does anticipate that there will be for communities and uh, landowners and also what costs uh, perhaps public bodies may incur? Well, one of the challenges we face is that as we move forward with land reform and the measures under this bill in terms of extending the rights of communities, everything will be demand-led. And it's difficult for ministers of the government to sit here and, and anticipate exactly what the demand will be in the years ahead. However, we have taken steps to ensure that there is more funding available to achieve our objectives. We've already announced that the land fund will increase substantially from 2016 onwards to £10 million a year. And we also have the Empowering Communities Fund, which the First Minister announced as part of our programme for government just in the last few days. And that's a further £10 million that will be available next year. 
and we'll, of course, have to consider how to take that forward in future years. So that will also be available to help communities take advantage of the new measures available in this bill. But in terms of the financial memorandum, um, because it's demand-led, there is, yes, a degree of uncertainty, but we do feel confident that with the increased land fund and the other fund I mentioned, funding will be available to help communities take more control of their own destiny. Okay. Uh, and with that uh, extra uh, money that you're talking about, uh, would that be directly directed to uh, communities or would it be to public bodies to help uh, perhaps communities to uh, have the community right to buy? Well, we'll have to give some thought to that. Clearly, there are some commitments for government to carry more of the costs in relation to the right to buy for communities in terms of the balloting costs, etc. Therefore, we'll have to meet those costs out of our budgets. But primarily, of course, these budgets are going to be used for communities as opposed to public bodies. But in terms of the cost of public bodies, if there are to be costs, clearly that's something we'll have to take into account. But the primary focus of these funds is to help communities. Okay. Uh, and just to perhaps finish up, I'm just wondering what sort of organisations you see as um, moving forward this, the, the, the agenda of community right to buy with not just financial support, but including financial support and, of course, an administ administrative support. Have, has that all been worked out yet? Organisations in terms of public bodies? or, or Public bodies or other third-party, uh, third-sector organisations? <coughs> Well, clearly there's going to be uh, an onus on many public bodies ranging from the, the General Registrars of Scotland, and there'll be funding brought forward separately for that as we register the ownership of all land in Scotland over the next 10 years, which is all about transparency of land ownership in Scotland. It's going to be a huge task in itself. So there are a number of public agencies and bodies that will have to take the burden of this agenda as we move forward. Even within my own portfolios, of course, the Forestry Commission will have a bit more work to do in terms of promoting this agenda in the future, uh, and we'll have to look at the budgets for the Forestry Commission. A lot of that should not be substantial costs, and we would expect that to be carried within existing budgets. So, you know, clearly this is demand-led. We do not know what neglected or abandoned land will be bought by communities. We do not know where the future applications will be for the, the urban right to buy or whatever. So it's demand-led. It's quite difficult to predict exactly which bodies are going to carry the costs or the extra burden. But clearly it's something we have to pay close attention to. And, you know, as I said before, uh, these are substantial funds we've brought forward and we'll have to keep reviewing those funds in the years ahead as the legislation kicks in. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Mike Russell and then Claudia Beamish. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Um, there is a the availability of money would be a, a huge boost, and obviously in the last year more money has become available, and the idea of uh, essentially uh, more money being possible as a result of other changes is great. But lack of money is only one problem. There is a quagmire of issues such as state aids, regulations under public finance, and a range of other matters, which can create very genuine difficulties for communities in, in, in buying uh, land and buying assets. Uh, so what I think is required, and I'd be interested to know what steps you're making to, to, to put this in place, what is required is a, a diagram of the way through for communities, some thinking through of the difficulties that each community will have, and a way to creating a path for community purchase that is not bedeviled by these issues. I mean, as you know, in my own area, we have the issue of Castle Tower at present, where state age is being used uh, as a, possibly an excuse for trying to delay uh, or even derail a buyout, where, in actual fact, a, a political will would allow that to take, the buyout to take place without much difficulty. So I wonder what your thinking is about this, how you're going to assist communities and community organisations to actually undertake it. One of the persistent criticisms, of course, in public policy is that what government high-level policy then gets bogged down in interpretation and implementation. How are you going to make sure this is implemented? Thank you, and I think you know, you're illustrating your, your, your knowledge and your interest in, in land reform issues, so I think uh, hopefully we can tap into your ideas and, and that will be reflected in the committee's recommendations at uh, stage one uh, on these issues. State aid, of course, and I know Michael Russell's taken a close interest in this for, for many years, uh, has been quite a challenging issue at times for the government in terms of taking forward 
uh, the community right to buy uh, and the use of the land fund, etc. We have, of course, just recently issued fresh guidance, taking a much more relaxed view of the state aid issues and, you know, quite clearly opening a, a cafe that's run by a community in the middle of a gale is not necessarily going to be a threat to competition, you know, 50 miles away. So we should be taking a much more relaxed attitude to that. And that is the instruction we are giving. In terms of moving forward and the idea of equipping communities with uh, more information and understanding of these kinds of issues, I think it's a good point. I think we do have to give a lot more thought to that. I will remind the committee, of course, that the Land Reform Review Group have recommended that we set up a community land agency. And our response to that has been that we will, within government, set up a unit that will look at those issues and work with communities to give much better advice and, of course, to be there as a huge support mechanism and to try and facilitate community buyouts. So I do feel that that's a role for the unit we're setting up in government and the state aid issue and explaining the, the, the pathway, as Michael Russell puts it, to our communities should be a very important function for a new unit, and I'll make sure that happens. That's very helpful. Can I just press you on the state aid issue a little? The new guidance is, is I know, quite clear, that there should be a much more relaxed view of that. Is that being punted, if I may use that word, to local authorities in a similarly um, aggressive manner so that local authorities do realise that these burdens do not normally exist in terms of community buyout? Well, I'll do my best to make sure that's the case. And the Aegis Forest in the north of Scotland, of course, the buyout of that has just been unlocked by a much more relaxed attitude towards state aid rules. So I think there's some evidence there that it is being listened to and, and heeded. Uh, and you know, I take on board the, the point that we have to make sure all public agencies and communities you know, are aware of the guidance and understand the message it's sending out. And the message is that this is a, an easier matter to do? Yes. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, following on, on those points about support for communities, you'll be aware of the social and land remit of High, and I'm wondering whether um, there are any plans uh, to extend the remit of uh, uh, Scottish Enterprise in view, in view of that, that, um, that support, but also just also in view of the different uh, agencies that you've highlighted this morning which are coming online anyway because sometimes people say oh there isn't the appetite for land reform in South Scotland for instance which I represent but one wonders the, the, de the degree to which that might be related to capacity building and support and advice as well. Well one of the key messages from the land reform process that we are now embarking on is that land reform, as you quite rightly say, is not just an issue for the Highlands and Islands, it's an issue for the whole of Scotland. And it's not just an issue for rural Scotland, it's an issue for urban Scotland as well. So that's why there's quite clearly a, a transformation in terms of the approach to land reform and the land question in Scotland. And all our agencies, be it Scottish Enterprise or Highlands and Islands Enterprise, it will have to play their role in taking forward the agenda. In terms of support for communities, I'll come back to this, the, the, the remit of Scottish Enterprise in a second, but in terms of support for communities, I can only reiterate my answer to Michael Russell, which is we are taking significant steps to beef up the support from the government, from the public agencies, for communities to help them through the process. And clearly that's communities throughout Scotland. And the unit we will set up within government to answer the the request from the review group and land reform will be there to help communities in the south of Scotland as much as the rest of Scotland, and perhaps even more so the south of Scotland, given HIE um, have had a proactive role in the Highlands and Islands. In terms of the future of the debate over the remit of Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, um, it, it is an issue. Clearly, there are historic reasons as to why there's a social and economic remit for Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise. Uh, does have, of course, a role within its rural communities, but not the same social remit that Highlands and Islands Enterprise has. These are ongoing discussions within government, uh, between myself and other ministers, uh, with responsibility for the enterprise agencies. Uh, but we will have to give some thought to how the, the agenda is taken forward in terms of the social remit uh, out with the Highlands and Islands. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, uh, 
we talked about many of the public agencies that might be involved uh, or could actually have to bear the burden of dealing with uh, the transfer of land. Um, is this an opportunity for us to include the Crown Estate Commission uh, in our thoughts just now? Because uh, given that Lord Smith has suggested that uh, much of its activity should be devolved to Scotland and that it's something that could be done perhaps earlier than uh, uh, certain other measures which are more complex, that we should think in terms of uh, their involvement uh, uh, in terms of liberating land for communities because they rent uh, land, i.e. moorings, for example, uh, to communities at the present time. And in fact, um, I have evidence from their session with us that they're selling um, uh, areas of the foreshore in the Isle of Lewis, I think the example was, to a local community. Um, is this the best way in which the Crown Estate should be divesting itself? Or does best value only include market value for them? Um, should we be thinking about including in our thoughts at the moment about the public agencies, their role in releasing land for communities? Well, firstly, <clears throat> can I say that I welcome the recommendation from the Smith Commission that the Crown Estate should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. That is, of course, long overdue. Indeed, at least one of the coalition parties in the UK government promised that back in 2010. And, of course, it's 2014 and we're still waiting. But finally, we do have a recommendation. And as you will be aware, the Scottish Government is calling on the UK government to ensure that uh, these pledges or recommendations are delivered as quickly as possible. Uh, and some quite easily could be delivered rather quickly compared to others. I would suggest the Crown Estate is one uh, recommendation that could be delivered sooner rather than later. In terms of... <coughs> uh, your, you asked a couple of questions there. In terms of its current activities, uh, I would ask the Crown Estate to begin to act as if it is already devolved. Uh, and the democratisation and accountability of the Crown Estate, I would like to see put into place as soon as possible. In other words, even though if the Crown Estate is not formally devolved at the moment, I would ask that the Crown Estate uh, consult our local authorities on any of those disposals, and indeed the Scottish Government, and we should start acting as if it's devolved at the moment. Uh, that would be a, a, a sign of respect from the, the UK Government and the Crown Estate, so I would make that plea. In terms of moving forward, I think which was your second question, Clearly, the Crown Estate being devolved to Scotland uh, will give both local authorities, because many of the powers within the Crown Estate will be devolved to local level, uh, particularly to our island communities, uh, but also in terms of the Scottish Government's responsibilities for managing the Crown Estate in the future, uh, the, the economic and social remit of how we manage the Crown Estate assets in Scotland should reflect our land reform agenda and our other social and economic policy objectives. So that's one of the key benefits of having the Crown Estate devolved to Scotland, is that we would clearly ensure the remit of how the Crown Estate was managed reflected our social and economic objectives uh, in Scotland. And back to Jim Hume. Yeah, it was just a point regarding the Highlands and Islands Enterprise. We have uh, been very much involved with uh, community buyouts and Scottish Enterprise, who in the past haven't, but what we've seen, of course, is devolved budgets of the local enterprise companies many moons ago now um, taken away, whereas Scottish Enterprise, all the decision-making seems to be taken only in Glasgow now. So it's, that seems to be a contradiction there. And in, the, and in the draft budget, we see that rural enterprise budget is to disappear by about 96 or 97 or 98 per cent, or, or thereabout, more or less, disappear off. So I just wonder wonder how you're balancing s stating that Scottish Enterprise you hope to do more with uh, in the communities, but the history and the, the proposed draft budget seems to say the opposite. The point I was making about Scottish Enterprise, even though it's not part of the formal remit to have you know, the, the social and economic dimension to that, in the way, same way that Highlands and Islands does, it does not mean that Scottish Enterprise is not responsible for promoting sustainable development in rural communities in the south of Scotland or anywhere that's uh, anywhere else. That's the point I was making. In terms of the budgets, uh, you will know in recent years there's been an extra focus given to Scottish Enterprise in terms of its, its key objectives and how it focuses in certain parts of the economy and the businesses it's working with. Uh, the backdrop to that is also, of course, the financial... Uh, climate uh, we've had to cope with at Scottish Government level with our budgets. Uh, however, moving forward, uh, you know, I, I've 
acknowledge that in terms of how we deliver the land reform agenda and the social agenda overall, we have to ensure that Scottish Enterprise is playing its role as much as Helens and Ellens will continue to do with its remit as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, some other points on the Finance Committee's view of this. Angus MacDonald. Okay, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, Mr Thompson. Um, you, you'll be aware, uh, Cabinet Secretary, of the, the Critchell Down Rules, uh, <laughs> 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 which, uh, uh, which have... Um, uh, which provide for, for land which uh, has been compulsorily purchased by a public authority uh, but is then deemed surplus and subject to disposal by the public authority in question. Now, in these cases, it's government policy for the previous owner to have right of first refusal. Um, do you have a view on, on how the extension to community right to buy might interact with these crucial down rules? Uh, the crucial down rules. <clears throat> of course, I am a, an expert on those rules. Uh, at least in the last 30 minutes before I came into the committee, I became an expert on those rules. Uh, I have looked at that, this, uh, and I know it's featured in the previous discussions uh, for the committee, and this essentially, as I understand it, relates to land that's previously being compulsory purchased, probably by public agencies for certain reasons, and therefore the previous owner has the first option when these properties or, or the land is being disposed of. So the question, as you quite rightly asked, is how does it interact with the community's right to buy? Well, our view is that it will depend what's in the public interest. Uh, the rules do not preclude the communities having the right to buy, but it would be a case-by-case -case basis in terms of whether it's in the public interest and the proposals being put forward by the community. So I think the message I'm trying to convey is that it would not preclude communities having the right to buy, but I can't speak for every single potential case that would come forward. Clearly, for public agencies, compulsory purchase land is for a whole variety of different reasons, and therefore it's difficult to predict what would happen in each different case. And so there's no reason why it should preclude that the rules are not statutory rules. Therefore, they'd be taken into account, but they would not necessarily determine the, the, the decision as to whether or not a community could buy land. Okay. I was just going to follow up by saying that you know, we abolished um, preemption, you know, when the, the uh, feudal system w was changed so that, for example, um, schools which were no longer used would go back to the, the landowner who provided the land in the first place. Uh, surely that would be uh, the same approach that we would adopt with regard to land which had been compulsorily purchased, which is a very similar circumstance uh, and that the critical down rules uh, apply to, but they're only uh, rules. Well, exactly, they are only rules, and you know, I will reflect Mind. as we take the, the legislation forward as to how we can best handle yeah. this. Uh, and obviously, I, I'd welcome the committee's views on how this can best be handled as well. Mike Russell. Yeah, the, the crucial down rules arose out of a case in which the Secretary of State for Agriculture had to resign, so I'm sure you will take them to heart. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> It would surely be possible to modify them by simply applying a, a, an additional test, which is whether the land in question would, had it not been purchased by the government, uh, b b have been likely to have been available for community purchase, because it applies to land that is bought from private landowners, given that they apply to uh, land bought during the Second World War. You know, I think that the, the test would be easily applied, and if that test was applied, then most land would not be covered by them. Yeah. Well, I knew when I said I was an expert on these rules that Michael Russell would be sitting here thinking, <laughs> not as much as he is. <laughs> so I do not want to resign over this issue, and I will make sure we clarify it. So I take the point, I'm sympathetic to the point made by Michael Russell. It does seem something should relatively simple uh, in terms of how we get around it. So I'll, I'll reflect on that. Uh, and Angus MacDonald again. Hey, thanks. Um, sticking with the, the financial uh, memorandum, an issue was highlighted in evidence from Sports Scotland. Uh, who said that they, they would not wish to see liabilities handed to community groups who then need to seek financial or other support from national organisations such as Sports Scotland, uh, which funding rules do not allow them to give. Um, and in the distribution of national lottery resources, uh, uh, we know that bodies such as Sports Scotland must follow the additionality principle. Uh, are you in a position um, to clarify how rules relating to lottery funding might impact on the community right to buy? Well, clearly I'll have the, the lottery funding rules uh, 
checked and double checked as we move forward. But in general, the rules relating to lottery funding, in our view, would not really have any impact on the right to buy. And we do not see a conflict there. But clearly, I would want to double check the actual lottery rules to make sure we get that right. But our initial view is that there's not a conflict and it should not present a problem. OK, that's Thank good. You. Thanks. Fine. Um, we'll move on to delegated powers memorandum. Anna Hilton. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just looking at the memorandum, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have raised concerns that the new section 97C3A on eligible, abandoned or neglected land um, in relation to eligible land and individuals' home and prescribed classes is very vague in respect of how this power will actually be used. And they've said that the government explanation so far is inadequate in light of the significance of this power. Um, I'd like to ask what you think, what the thinking is behind, behind taking this new power on, and if you can offer any examples that demonstrate how the power may be used in practice and explain, indeed, how you intend to use this power. Um, OK, <clears throat> thank you. Well, this is clearly to give the opportunity to ministers to exclude land uh, from the, the right to buy. And the obvious case in point is someone's home, which would happen to be part of you know, the area that a community wishes to, to purchase. Uh, we would take a sensible approach to these issues in terms of the next question would be, how do you define a home? Uh, is it someone who you know, lives there uh, once every two years or who's not lived there for five years, it's still their home? Uh, clearly, we would have to draw up some uh, rules and guidance to, to define the issues we take into account as to whether or not a home should be excluded in, a, in an individual case. Um, I, I know there are some concerns that perhaps we've over-egged the pudding in terms of this, this power. So I am going to review that, and ministers will review it. Uh, we'll still have to have the power to exclude, for example, homes. But I, have, I am reflecting some of the comments the committee have received. And of course, again, if the committee has some specific views on this delegated power and how it should be used, I'd welcome that. But the purpose is just an obvious one. There are some areas that would have to be excluded. OK. Any other points on that? Yes, Graham Day. Thank you. Just, just going back to the point you made, Cabinet Secretary, about the rules and guidance being drawn up, and you, I think you used the phrase sensible approach. Um, that, <laughs> given the, the current Scottish ministers may well interpret these ru rules in a, a fair way, an appropriate way, how do we ensure that successive ministers in years to come, decades to come, would do the same thing? How do you draw this power, these powers up in a way that ensures that they would only ever be used properly? Well, firstly, there will be what is in the face of the bill, and then there will be secondary legislation, if required, to give further definitions. And we are giving some thought to that. And in terms of future ministers, as is, as is the case always, ministers will have to take a judgment when the, they receive an application as to whether or not, uh, in their view, uh, they can defend that, you know, falling under certain uh, rules or exemptions. So. Uh, as I said before, we'll give some further thought to this to make sure it's easy to understand and simple to put in place. But there is a case, of course, as I said before, to have some exclusions. OK. Thank you. Um, thinking about the nature of land in which an interest may be registered, start off with Jim Hume. Uh, thank you very much, Con convener. Uh, just, yeah, so, uh, just regarding extending the community right to buy into urban areas. Uh, the Law Society had some concerns uh, stating, and I quote, small communities in an urban environment might be interested in a particular asset that's part of a larger asset that is capable of de development. In such a case, the development could become blighted and there could be a scenario of competing interests and they go on to state that they think there should be some safeguards to, to balance that out. Uh, I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary shares the Law Society's concerns and relation to the, these sorts of developments, uh, or development blight, I should state, and uh, wonder if he's considering amendments at stage two to address this. <clears throat> Clearly, for any application for the right to buy, ministers have to take into account a couple of tests, uh, one being the proposal from the community 
Will it promote sustainable development and is it in the public interest? Secondly, would leaving the current ownership arrangements in place further sustainable development? This is like a double test, if you like. Therefore, the issue of blight would clearly be taken into account as part of those tests. In other words, if ministers judge an application to be in the interest of sustainable development, then that would suggest that there's not really a blight. And if the view of ministers was that this was to cause significant blight and harm sustainable development, well, then clearly ministers have to take into account as to whether or not they can give the, the right for, to register or for the, right, the right to buy. So <clears throat> I'm just thinking that you know, the Law Society are creating a scenario which is something that would be taken into account as part of the process. You know, because ministers would not want to create a blight because a blight is negative, and therefore that would be taken into account in itself in terms of sustainable development. Okay. Uh, I'm just yep. going to, uh, if I can just give an example, I'm just trying to think of an example to make this sound you know, a bit more understandable. If, for instance, there was a new block of flats being built and it was good for the area and suddenly there was an application to buy part of that or part of the land, you could argue that would cause a blight, potentially. But then ministers would have to take into account as to whether or not uh, accepting or rejecting an application is good for sustainable development. And it may be in the interests of the community that the block of flats is not blighted and is allowed to be built or completed or whatever, and therefore would not allow the application to go forward. So I think there's ways of avoiding the blight. OK, uh, thanks for that. I just want to move on to some evidence that we received, uh, I think it was last week, regarding local authorities and lands that they hold. We heard... We heard that Glasgow uh, local authority uh, ha has land, but has bonded uh, some of their land uh, to, I think it was Barclays Bank, if I'm uh, not, not incorrect. Um, therefore, it would be very difficult for them to actually release their land for, for communities. Now, this may be uh, the same in other local authorities. I don't know if you have uh, evidence on that. But bearing, putting that to the side, Eve, uh, some local authorities, of course, do hold land and maybe see its best value as being the best financial value for their, their uh, community ta uh, taxpayers, obviously. So they see it as a financial and perhaps not community uh, being their number one priority. I just wonder what your thoughts are on local authorities' views on what they interpret best value is of uh, land and if that could be a potential hindrance to some communities who maybe want to access some of the, this local authority and public body land? Well, local authorities do have the power to dispose of land at less than market value and they are able to take into account the public interest as a value. Therefore, this should not be an obstacle and local authorities clearly you know, have the ability to have their discretion in how they define the value of the public interest or, uh, you know, or whether or not they want to sell at the market value. Um, but that should not be an obstacle, and we would encourage local authorities to recognise that supporting the public interest is a value in itself. And when you're looking at the value of what you're receiving for disposing of an asset, uh, it's not always monetary value. It's the value to the community and, and for the public interest. So that should be a factor in the thinking of any local authority. Mm -hmm. I, th th thanks for that. I would guess that some local authorities would look at that differently to other local authorities. I just wonder what mechanisms would be available then for a, a community who maybe has uh, got to the stage where the local authorities decided we don't want to sell below market value. Uh, we've got to look after the... The, the, the rates payers, etc. So we're not going to sell. Where does the community go from there? <clears throat> I would hope that would not occur, or at least be very rare. I think we have to take a step back for a second or two and just remind ourselves that many of those negotiations are conducted in a, a constructive manner. And you know, I would hope that local authorities would engage with communities, as they often do, in a constructive manner and reach an agreement. Uh, I don't think there's a great history of local authorities or public agencies trying to um, frustrate or resist communities in their aspirations. So I would hope those occasions would be very, very rare. 
I don't have a formal mechanism whereby someone can intervene, you know, to, to force the local authority to, to sell, other than, you know, what's coming forward in the bill in terms of neglected and abandoned land. So I just think, you know, it's not always easy to give answers to all these potential scenarios. We have to try and avoid them happening in the first place. And I think ensuring our local authorities are engaging constructively with communities is the best way to do that. I, I appreciate that. I, I hope it is. I hope it is real. But um, I, would, I would appreciate if maybe the cabinet sec secretary would uh, keep, keep an eye on that in some respect, and maybe even give some guidance to some local authorities to perhaps look at their their uh, assets in perhaps a, a more uh, broader way than has perhaps happened in the past. Yeah, perfectly fair point, and you know I think that's something we would be keen to do as we take forward the bill. And again, if the committee is getting any specific suggestions mm -hmm. uh, to address that potential scenario, you know, we're all ears. Okay, thanks. Mike Russell? Would it be possible to address this issue in the subsequent land reform bill with a role for a putative land commission to, or land, standing land body to have a role in adjudicating cases where local authorities regrettably will sometimes endeavour to frustrate communities? Well, I think, I think that's a good point, and I think it's a, it's a good suggestion. It's something we should take away and ask the, the, the unit we're setting up to facilitate community purchases in the government to look at and to take responsibility for, to help mediate, facilitate, I think is a perfectly sensible idea. Cabinet Secretary, you said that you weren't sure about whether you had powers to ensure that local authorities actually divested themselves of land in a suitable fashion for communities. Um, is that the kind of thing you're talking about the Land Commission developing? Or is it the kind of thing which should be written into the Land Reform Bill? Well, <clears throat> local authorities have guidance and there is statutory obligations in terms of you know, some of these issues. I, mean, I was just trying to address the specific scenario that Jim Hume mentioned. Uh, however, we are undertaking at least two things I want to clarify here as part of land reform review group recommendations. Firstly, is the land commission, which will be a standing body that will look at land reform issues and advise government as to how to, to solve them and how to take forward certain uh, policy objectives. So that's, a, that's a, the land commission, which we will set up in due course. The second thing is the land unit within government, which will be the equivalent of the recommendation from the review group to set up a, a community land agency which will facilitate, advise communities to help further uh, community ownership of land in Scotland. So just to address your, your question, there's also there's two, two bodies there, and I think it would be something for the Land Commission to look at in terms of public agency and public land. We're already committed as a, as a government to facilitating public land be made available to communities. So that's already there, that commitment. If there are specific scenarios that arise that are problematic, yes, we would seek advice, advice from the Land Commission. But both uh, Jim Hume and Mike Russell have raised questions that arose particularly from evidence about uh, the City of Glasgow. Um, we don't know what other uh, local authorities think about this. Um, I th and it could be something which could be uh, valuable to the process of uh, this Community Empowerment Bill. Uh, do you think that uh, the government's in a position to find this out uh, for us about what other attitudes there are out there? Because it was, frankly, quite shocking to hear that it was likely that much of the derelict property in Glasgow uh, could not be passed to communities. And, you know, the attitude of uh, local authorities to passing on uh, resources was brought into question by the witness who suggested that Basically, they knew how to look after them, but prob probably communities might not. Well, again, it's a good point, and clearly a number of members have raised this issue, so you have to let me please just reflect on that and see if we can take forward anything at stage two of the bill or whether we should be having some se separate uh, communication with local authorities in Scotland about that. Because we're keen that you know we're all... Uh, wanting to further the policy objective of community ownership in Scotland, and I'm sure that applies to local authorities as much as Scottish Government, and you know, we have to work together to achieve that. So if there's something we should be doing at stage two in terms of legislation, or whether 
Uh, there's something else we should be doing. I'm, 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 again, I'm keen to look at that and I'll reflect on what you're saying today. Okay. Mike Russell? I don't think the Scottish Government is committed to land reform and to the transfer of assets. I don't think there's any doubt that many communities are committed to it. I think the question is, I'm not making a blanket statement about local authorities, I think the question is, are local authorities fully committed to it? Uh, and if they are not fully committed to it, and there are instances where either they have entered into arrangements which make it impossible, as with Glasgow, or there are other local authorities whose enthusiasm is, is not palpable, I think you could put it that way, then I think there will need to be uh, a mechanism to drive this forward. And I think the question, Cabinet Secretary, is what that mechanism is, uh, where it can be found, and how it can be placed on the face of the bill, because that will be essential. Yeah. And I take the point. I, I expect, as Minister, the Government expects all public authorities and bodies to uh, deliver the policy objectives uh, that Scotland wants to see delivered. So there's a mechanism that needs to be designed. You know, we will certainly reflect on what that could be. Thank you for that. Um, the meaning of community, um, Claudia Beamish. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, obviously the definitions of community um, are very complex uh, and varied. Um, in, as you'll know, in Section 34 of the 2003 Act, there's a provision only for um, a legal entity which um, is a company limited by guarantee to, to actually um, register. Um, and there are also issues around postcode units, um, which, um, the, which going forward are, are raised and we've heard about in committee. Uh, there are issues also about um, the Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisations, or SCIOs, and um, BENCOMs have been raised as a possibility, which aren't actually identified, as I understand it, so far in um, Section 28 of the Bill, I think, or, or beyond that. Um, so if, if I could just highlight that, according to the policy memorandum, the section... Um, makes it easier for communities to define themselves in a greater variety of ways rather than postcode. Um, but oral evidence did broadly support um, this amendment. However, there was a divided opinion about um, communities of interest, and some stress, someone stressed the, um, that this would be a good deal more complex to define, and uh, on the other hand, there was the argument that a way had to be found, and I quote, to pour to put more emphasis on people rather than place. Now, these were views expressed to the committee, but it's obviously important going forward that we're aware of um, your, your, your view on this as, as a committee. And is, is, is it your intention, could you let us know at this stage, to, to do any of this by amendment to the bill um, mm. or in subsequent guidance? And what is the view... Um, of the evidence that suggests it might be helpful to specify characteristics of an eligible community by, um, by how, how, how it is a legal entity rather than sort of specifically what it, what it, what it actually is, if I'm being clear about that. I know this is quite complicated, but... Um, so it would be helpful to, to know your views on, on those areas. <clears throat> yes, this, the issue you raise is certainly featured in your discussions and is something we have been giving thought to. I mean, firstly, clearly, one of the purposes of Part 4 of the Bill is to make it easier for communities to, to register and ultimately uh, take over land. Uh, and one of the relaxations we are putting in the Bill to make that a bit easier and streamline the relevant provisions is to kind of relax the definition of communities and you're quite right of course that's going to now include not just uh, companies limited by guarantee but also Scottish charitable and incorporated organisations the SCIOs which are creatures of OSCAR the regulator for charities uh, and we are looking at potential amendments to stage two to extend that list further uh, perhaps to uh, other kinds of community uh, bodies that can be created uh, however, it is important that the community defines itself as a community is actually the community. And therefore, communities of interest, which is one of the debates you mentioned, whether or not we should allow communities of interest to be created and defined as the community, does give us some concerns. And therefore, that we're not proposing to include that as things stand. Because quite clearly, that could be 
you know, something that's set up that's got an interest in the community, but it's not the community itself. And we want to maintain the sense of place and ensure that we generally are dealing with the communities. So a community of interest, I guess in theory, could be a organisation that's based far away, has some, perhaps some local members, and has an interest in the community, but is not really the community in our view, and doesn't have that sense of place, not rooted there. So I think we want to avoid, at this stage, going down the route of allowing communities of interest to be defined as communities. Do you think that might be quite restrictive in a way? If I give the example of, say, um, in, in a large city, an ethnic minority group that wanted to, um, to buy some land for a purpose that was related to the community, uh, that it would be much larger than a, a, a clearly <coughs> defined smaller geographical area or, or, a, a, an, a, or place. And that would just be one example, and I'm sure there are many others of, of groups that, well, I'm not sure, actually. I wonder, I ask the question if there are many others uh, which might um, come into that sort of a, an area of um, interest. Yeah. Well, firstly, we'll, we'll ensure we've got the ability in future to bring forward further definitions of community. Should, in future years, we take decisions that there are, a, 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 there is a case for extending the definition of communities. Uh, however, We just don't want to open the gates too much to new definitions of community that could create problems in the future. Uh, you know, I've, you know I, I'm trying to think of an analogy. For instance, I've had uh, wind farms in my constituency um, opposed by many, many people, and it transpires that 80 percent or 70 percent of the people that have opposed live several hundred miles away. And you know they may argue they've got a community interest, <laughs> but I don't think anyone would recognise that they're the community, uh, and therefore you've got to balance these issues. I just think communities of interest could just open up the gates too wide, and allow uh, the definition of community to be just too wide and not actually generally be the sense of place and the sense of community we expect when it comes to a community taking control of its own destiny. Mm -hmm. So I'll reflect on any views the committee has. Mm -hmm. And, I think, and, David, yeah, yeah. we've got two Dave Thompsons here today. I think I'll ask my Dave Thompson next to me to say a few words. I think he wants yeah. to add something. I mean, as far as community of interests are concerned, the, 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 the bill as it stands doesn't categorically preclude them. For example, um, say you have Leith Amateur Dramatic Society. Now, they are a community of interest in terms of dramatic society. You would expect that the majority of their members are situated in Leith, within still the, the, the geographic area that the community body is set up to do. Now, in those circumstances, one of the issues we have with communities of interest is, as part of the process, a community body, when purchasing an asset, has to undergo a ballot. Now, who would you say was eligible for that ballot in a community of interest? Yeah, it, in terms of, sort of the practical process, we have to be able to check that everybody on the list is eligible. They've not put Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, etc. on the list. Just be slightly flippant, but that's the sort of things we have to check. That's very, very difficult to do with a community of interest. As I say, with the, the Dramatic Society, they will have an element in leaf, and those that stay within that geographic area who are members of that community of interest will have and can set up that community body. So there's the geographic element, and those within that geographic element will have you know, the, 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 the right to set up the body to vote, etc. And I realise that doesn't cover all of them. But again, it takes the, the, the issue of having community of interest, which are 600 miles away, influence what's happening in the community next door to you. Um, uh, just through the convener, I, I understand the argument you're making. It's very important that, that it's clearly defined in terms of membership. But, but slightly different in Leith to, say, Straven, which I represent, where mm -hmm. there are people in, in rural... Clydesdale, who I know, who travel 20 or 30 miles to go to Australian or uh, mm -hmm. Choral Society. So I think it, you do, we do need to look at that issue of, of definition in relation to people as well as place. Um, and I just wonder, just finally, about... Um, there's been the suggestion of specifying the characteristics of an eligible community body rather than specifying the specific types of legal entity. And I wonder if that might help to make it more uh, possible for, for um, communities to apply, or to register, rather? I, I think if we took the, the route of just defining the characteristics 
as opposed to the kind of entities, then that really would open up a can of worms and, you know, you'd have a whole debate over what the characteristics should be and then you'd stray into some of the debates we've just been having. So uh, I think you just have to be cautious about that. However, as I said before, we're, we are keeping an open mind and we'll have the ability to bring through secondary legislation additional definitions if we think that's required. But again, you know, if the, if the committee has strong views on this, please convey them to the government. Thank you. We will indeed, I'm sure. Um, uh, detailed procedures and requirements. Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and Dave Thompson. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we've had quite a bit of discussion in relation to registration and indeed whether uh, registration or pre-registration, I suppose, um, is, should be necessary at all because many, many uh, communities um, won't know that a piece of land is um, going to need to be taken over by them, if I can put it like that, until something actually happens. And we had evidence from the Home Hall people about a piece of uh, what they thought was public ground um, uh, suddenly going on the market, and it was a great asset for that community. Um, so... First of all, I'd just like to get your views on um, whether we actually need pre any kind of pre-registration, um, and then I'll maybe follow up uh, on some other issues to do with that uh, after your initial comments. Thank you, and it's quite a fundamental point that you're raising. Uh, clearly, the government has to balance the rights of someone to sell their, their assets with the rights of the community. So there's a couple of issues we have to take into account in, in response to the point you're raising. Firstly, as part of the process for application, we have to know that we have a community and the community is taking steps to take on the responsibility of ownership. And if there were to be uh, no need to register, and you were just to wait for the land to come up, to come up for sale before you had the, the, the process in place and a body to apply, then you don't really have a community. It has to be created. Whereas the process we're laying out means you have a community. It's defined. It's thinking about the future. It's preparing the option of taking on responsibility for ownership and everything that comes with that. And it has a vision for the future. <coughs> and it has a desire to have more control of its own destiny, and that's all in place. Uh, and then the process kicks in at that point. If you didn't have that, clearly you'd have to create it. So not only would you have the challenge of having to create that, but you'd also be interfering with the rights of the individual or, or, or body that wants to sell property or assets, uh, because quite clearly you would have to wait the, the seller would be disadvantaged because they would have to wait until everything was set up, the community was formed, it was decided who the community were, they had to put together a plan, they had to get through the various processes to, to get the go-ahead. And therefore, you know, if you were selling a bit of your land, for instance, would you want to wait a year or two after putting it you know, on the market before you could actually do anything with it because the government would have to stop you? while the community was created. So that would, we believe, interfere with the, the rights that people have to sell their assets. Whereas the process we are proposing and we have in place already is a bottom-up process that allows the community to express its desire to control its own destiny and there's a community there in the first place. So that's the rationale behind the, the process. Okay. Uh, well, well, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, if there has to be um, some kind of uh, pre-registration as opposed to, to late registration, I'll come on to that in a minute, um, one of the suggestions that, that we heard uh, last week, I think it was, was that it might be better if a community could register for a purpose rather than for a piece of land. Because the community may have aspirations in relation to something they want to do in their community, create some kind of 
of park or create some kind of building for a function. So if a, if a community group wasn't aware of particular pieces of land that they might identify as being suitable or particular buildings, what would your view be on allowing registration to be for a purpose rather than purely for a specific piece of land or building? <clears throat> I'll ask Dave to, to come in on that because that, I think, is, uh, there has been some discussions with stakeholders over that. Um, I, again, it would just come back to the balance because you still have the situation of when the land went for sale and how that relates to what the community have registered for. Um, can I ask David, I think there's been some discussion with stakeholders that David might be able to update us on. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the, this comes on to the, the one of the changes that's within the bill to show we're at the moment for, and it's in terms of a late application, um, which will probably come on to in a wee while, but at the moment they have to show that there are good reasons for the application being late in the first place. That's been changed to show that they must have taken undertaking relevant work and reasonable steps. What that is intended is, is the sort of scenario you're talking about where a community body is there and has been set up and they have considered the fact that they have particular needs. That may, and again, this is it will be on a case-by-case -case basis, but that may be one way to show that they have taken undertaken relevant work prior to the land going on sale. So we're trying to... Trying to to give more flexibility in communities to show this, this is the work we have done. No, we haven't started to fill the form in yet, but we have taken these steps. We've identified the need. We've said we may need five hectares. We haven't said where and we haven't said which specifically, but we are taking the steps. We've, we've, we've had a, a community meeting and we've got agreement from the community to say that, yes, they are behind these ideas, but we don't exactly where yet. So they can all be examples of, of reasonable steps or reasonable work. Um, yeah. But as a case-by-case case basis, obviously. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand that, and that's fine uh, in relation to the late applications, and I, I want yeah. to maybe tease that out as well. But in terms of allowing people to register an interest in, for a purpose rather than for a piece of land or a building, has any thought been given to that? It would allow groups mm. that have got ambitions to... Say, say a group say, decides they want a skate park in their area, but there's no obvious piece of land that springs out, uh, or they might have to register for a number of pieces of land, none of which they know is going to come for sale. But they want to, to register to build a skate park for the youngsters, and they want to be, have gone through the process, hopefully a simple registration process, ready so that when a piece of land in the, in the area comes up, and it could be anywhere, and it might just suddenly pop up and maybe a piece of land that nobody ever thought would be available. They've done everything. They've shown their community. They've registered to build this skate park. So they're ready to go right away. I mean, is that something that the government will consider? Even though it's called late registration, which perhaps is not the right title for what you're referring to, um, as you've just heard, there is a potential scenario whereby if they've carried out the work, albeit not the specific part of land has been identified, then they may well qualify. So I think we may have to reflect on that and see if that needs finessed, because clearly that's under the, the title of a late registration, and that's not exactly what you're speaking about, but it, it would still have the same outcome, potentially. I can, I can see that it might have, have the same Because the work's been done, outcome. you just don't have the specific bit of land identified, yeah, therefore yeah, you could qualify yeah. as a late registration mm -hmm. for a specific mm -hmm. part of land that did then become mm -hmm. available in the market. But the, the only difference would be that the criteria then that relate to a late registration, it's maybe an opportunity to move on to that, might be more difficult for, for them. Um, I suppose if they've done the work previously, you're right that, that it wouldn't. I just want to make sure that it's as easy as possible for communities to get registrations because they would, I mean, why not allow them to register for a purpose as well as a piece of land or a building early? You know, then they're registered and, and their forum doesn't have to come in late and therefore block somebody's sale. So maybe it's something you could consider as an additional um, pur purpose, that, that, that if they can register for a purpose as well as for a specific piece of land, that might be uh, worth looking at. 
Um, just, just moving on, I mean, and also one quick point, uh, the re-registration process, we've had evidence there too that uh, it's five years at the moment suggested, ten years I think is, it would be a more reasonable uh, time for, for re-registration and also it should be easy for people to re-register because if there have been no material changes and they're just saying, look, I want my registration to continue, they should basically be able to sign a bit of paper just saying that, rather than, as I understand at the moment, having to go through the full process from scratch every five years. So, you know, I think a, a simple re-registration process would be useful as well. Okay. Um, well, firstly, we are simplifying the registration process so they don't have to start from scratch every five years. Uh, so that will be addressed uh, in the bill. I think your second point gives us perhaps a bit more of a problem uh, in that if you were to extend the five years threshold to ten years, um, things can change in ten years. You know, you can imagine a community defining itself thinking its future, putting its ideas together, carrying out its registration. And then 10 years later on, things could be quite different. And, you know, that we don't think would be wise. Uh, therefore, five years was a judgment of a good time scale. It, you know, to a certain extent, you're just picking a time scale, but five years is there because it's a reasonable time scale where things are unlikely to have changed dramatically in terms of the land that's been registered for, in terms of the, 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 the dynamic behind the community that got going and registered. Whereas 10 years down the line, or whatever figure you want to pick, things could be quite different. And therefore, the judgments the ministers have to make as well not to give the go-ahead could be based on different different dynamics. I suppose uh, if, it's a, if it is a very simple process, then every five years wouldn't be too onerous. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I will look forward to that simple process. Uh, it's just the mere fact that communities yeah. can change in 10 years, and if you've gone yeah. through the, the hurdles of registering the people who've gone through those, those hurdles involved in the project, involved in defining the community, being the community, the 10% the of the community you need to get behind the registration in the first place, all that could have changed in 10 years' time. So it's just yeah, a, yeah. A, we think five years is a sensible time scale. No, th thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Can I move on? I've just got a couple of other uh, wee points. Um, the, the way that late registrations are proposed to be uh, dealt with, uh, the good reasons test has been taken out, and that's welcome. But the one that's been put in is that the community has to show that such relevant work as ministers consider, consider reasonable was carried out. Now, again, I think from the Home Hill uh, community evidence, um, the piece of land that uh, came up uh, for sale in their community, and they had lots of difficulty dealing with the current legislation, was a lovely piece of common land, as they thought, um, they had no inclination whatsoever that there was any chance of that coming on the market. So they had done nothing. Therefore, that test would mean they wouldn't even be able to start the process of a late application. And communities are often not going to know and never going to anticipate that certain pieces of land or buildings are maybe going to come on the market. So I just wonder, is that not too tough a test for late for these late registrations? Okay. I think to a certain extent you're, you're repeating you know, the debate we just had a few moments ago about balancing the rights between the, the seller and the owner uh, and the rights of the communities. And it, it kind of addresses the same points uh, in that you're asking for no need to register just to have the opportunity to buy land that comes to the market. It's not really. It, it, it's but, that they shouldn't need to show that they've... Why, why should they need to show they've done anything? prior to the late registration? Well, just for the reasons we're trying to balance the rights mm. that we have to do, as you understand, between those that are selling and who own property and the communities. However, to make life a lot easier for the communities, we are relaxing a lot of the criteria and we are making the process much more streamlined. So we are, I believe, empowering communities. You're clearly wanting to go slightly step further. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that in those circumstances, often 
negotiation takes place. The, the history of many community buyouts in Scotland, as we're all aware, is that the negotiations take place and often they are concluded uh, to everyone's satisfaction. So what you're speaking about is a last resort in terms of if you know the, this community had wanted this land, suddenly didn't realise it was ever going to come up for sale, but it did come up for sale. Well, hopefully the, the negotiation took place there with the seller and the community would get access to it. Mm -hmm. uh, using legislation in those circumstances, of course, would just be a last resort. Uh, but, you know, I'll reflect on the point you're making. And again, you know, if the, com the committee feel there's a, a way in which we can balance those rights and achieve that outcome you want to achieve, you know, please, you know, make your recommendations and we'll listen closely. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. A couple of other very minor points. Very um, minor points. Just as a follow on... Sorry, I couldn't be in <laughs> um, if, if a piece of land comes in the market, the community successfully get a late application in, uh, the landlord doesn't like that and withdraws it from the market, that kills the whole thing, um, as I understand it. Would it be worth considering something in the bill... Uh, or in regulation or whatever that would prevent a landlord withdrawing a piece of land or a building from the market once they'd put it on the market uh, to prevent them thwarting a community's wish to um, buy that land. Because if it just comes up and the community go in for it and the landlord thinks, ah, oh, no way, and withdraws it, that, that's it dead. So would it be worth considering looking at preventing? Once it goes on the market, it's on the market, and the community would have a right to see that whole process through. And one other very tiny thing, there's no ability to amend applications, as I understand it, at the moment. And if there's a minor change needed to an application, the whole thing has to start again. So there needs to be an ability to amend applications as you're going... Through the, through the process. That was evidence we got last week, I think, from Simon Fraser, if I remember correctly. Well, I'll take away the point about amending the legislation, uh, the, the application uh, once it's submitted. You know, the government would want to cooperate and help communities as much as possible, and we're, uh, if there's a way of doing that, I'm sure we'd find a way of doing that. But, you know, I'll reflect on whether or not that needs to be reflected in the legislation itself. In terms of your second point, <coughs> clearly... The, what you're effectively suggesting is compulsory purchase, because if a seller puts property or land in the market, in theory they have the right, of course, to change their minds, as, as any of us may want to do if we were ever to, to sell an asset. Uh, your, your point there is the motivation for taking it off the market is the fact the community wanted to purchase it. Uh, I think we'd have to give some thought to, to how that would work, because the outcome is a compulsory purchase. Uh, and while there's powers clearly uh, for profiting communities and there's powers over neglecting and abandoned land, you're speaking about a further power, which is compulsory purchase, where the specific motivation for taking land off the market was because the community wanted to purchase it. You'd have to prove that. I'm sure that'd be challenging in itself. So I don't see an easy answer to that within the context of the legislation. So I'll have to reflect on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd appreciate that. I would be thinking once it's on the market, that should be absolute. So you wouldn't have to prove anything, but anyway. But again, you're interfering with the rights of uh, people to change their minds. And, you know, we're not talking, uh, we're not we're not talking simply about landed estates or large areas of land. We're talking no. about all kinds of assets here. Mm -hmm. And people have to have the right to change their minds. Mm -hmm. As we would want to perhaps sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, um, part of the problem about this is communications. And uh, it seems to me that, that uh, community planning partnerships have been the uh, organisation set up under the first executive of this uh, Scottish Parliament. And community planning partnerships should be a place where people uh, discuss the potential uses of uh, particular parts of the land in, a, in an area. Do we think that uh, actually they are providing the kind of service to this important new power that's being developed with regard to communities having a greater right to buy assets? Are they actually local enough to be able to do this? Or indeed, are they active enough 
to engage people in the process that needs to take place where discussions about potential uh, matters of interest take place, uh, arise, and uh, indeed then relate to particular pieces of land. Well, firstly, I think community planning partnerships should be local enough. The question is whether they are committed to the agenda and are spending enough time working together, which is the purpose of community planning, to further uh, and facilitate the issues of, of land reform. So that is something that we do have to take forward in terms of communication and working with our community planning partners across Scotland, uh, and we will undertake to do that. Thank you. Um, I want to move on to the next questions of abandoned and neglected land definitions. And I think uh, Mike Russell is going to lead us on this one. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, when we took evidence last week, and I think the week before, though I wasn't there, the issue of abandoned and neglected land uh, was uh, subject to some comment for a variety of reasons. First of all, because the legal definition of abandoned land is not the definition that the, the bill has, and that would lead to some confusion. Secondly, in the, I think in the words of one witness, the term was regarded as suboptimal in terms of what was trying to be achieved. Thirdly, because there are some issues to do with the use of land which could lead to abandoned or neglected land being, for example, neglected by a tenant, but still perfectly usable by the owner. And there might be some environmental issues that would arise here. So all in all, it was felt that some considerably more, considerably more work was required on the issue of abandoned and neglected land. There was also a concern that if the definition of abandoned and neglected land was left to guidelines, this would not be fair on anybody and might indeed be subject to legal challenge. So there is a, there is a general set of concerns, not at the, what the, 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 the policy intends to achieve, because I think all of us know, and particularly in, in, in urban areas, it's quite easy to point to, but it needs to achieve it in a way that is, if I may put it this way, achievable, rather than a way which can either be legally challenged or which will lead to the legislation not being used. So really what I'm looking for is a commitment to take this away and consider it for amendment in a way that can be uh, more useful. Uh, thank you. And clearly one of the more radical aspects of legislation is the ability to buy abandoned or neglected land. We are giving some thought to whether there's a need for additional clarity, and again, the, the views of the committee would be most helpful, and Michael Russell has also made a couple of good points there. We have to balance the interpretation of abandoned and neglected with the need to make it relatively wide in terms of definition. So if we're too specific, then there may be circumstances which are excluded. We don't want to be excluded. So we have to, I think, be reasonably wide-ranging in our definition. That's why the bill, as proposed, sticks to the simple definition, the dictionary definitions of abandoned and neglected, which you know, everyone understands and we believe would give good grounds for communities to, to purchase. Um, there are some issues clearly that have been uh, raised, such as uh, the definition of wholly or mainly neglected or abandoned. Again, you know, ministers will have the ability to interpret what that means. And we don't want to dwell too much on definitions because we're just dancing ahead of a pin. Ultimately, ministers will recognise, as will the communities who are making the applications, what is neglected or abandoned. There are other facts that you're quite right that have to be taken into account. Environmental considerations will have to be taken into account. If it appears to be abandoned, but it's because of environmental designations or whatever that may be, clearly that would then be exempt and the ministers would take that into account. So we will give some more thought to the, the arguments made to the committee and the need for potential clarity. But I'm just trying to say that we don't want to narrow down too much the definitions. I think that very wise, but I, I do disagree with you in terms of everyone knows what it means. And if I may <laughs> use the two words, somebody's you know, wildflower garden could be, to other, somebody else, a neglected piece of ground. I think neglected is very subjective indeed. And abandoned has, regrettably, another legal definition. You know, abandoned land is land which a, a landowner has mm -hmm. deliberately walked away from, does not want. You know, it, is, it is not theirs as far as they're concerned. I think that it would be very difficult if the term was to be used in one sense in a piece of legislation, in another sense commonly in Scots law. So I think there will need to be either a much clearer definition, and I know how difficult definitions are, 
or there will need to be uh, uh, alternative terms will need to be found. I think environmentally, too, it's very important that if the land is to be put to better purpose, then there's some definition of what that, that means. Well, again, you know, and notwithstanding, I agree that you know we will look at the, the issue of further clarity. We will be taking into account the public interest and what is best for sustainable development, and that's you know the ultimate tests. But in terms of definition of neglected uh, and abandoned lands, you know there are definitions, and the dictionary definitions, because the more you add into the bill, the more you move away from the simple dictionary definition and then the more argument there is. But we do have the simple dictionary definitions. So I will reflect on the arguments made to the committee and that uh, have been made today at the, at, the, at the committee itself to see if there's a, a need for further clarity. Another issue arises... Sorry, in, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. I just wonder if I yeah, okay. could just ask a quick supplementary on, on this issue. Yeah. Um, thank you. Very, very briefly, um, a number of witnesses last week inferred that um, this whole area was probably more relevant and would certainly be easier to implement in urban situations mm. rather than rural situations. Um, and indeed, one even suggested that we should perhaps be looking at uh, a differentiation of this section of the legislation between urban and rural situations. And I just wonder whether that is something uh, which, the cabinet, which the Cabinet Secretary is sympathetic to at least looking at um, as we go forward in this, mm. with this legislation. Um, I read that evidence, and uh, yep. I read the evidence, and I'm, I'm aware of it. Um, we've not reached a decision as to whether or not we're going to address that yet. Uh, I think we'll have to just reflect on what that means, because quite clearly, circumstances in urban communities in the middle of a town or city are radically different to large tracts of land in rural communities, and you know. Uh, the definitions could potentially be interpreted in different ways, but that's for understandable reasons because, you know, um, a large or, or, or a few acres in the middle of a city where it would appear to be neglected or abandoned, but there may be one part of it that the owner could argue is not abandoned or neglected, uh, you know, would be an argument perhaps put forward. But that's why you have the definitions of, you know, mainly or wholly neglected or abandoned in the bill because quickly the minister the government can look at the situation and use sensible judgment as to whether it really is abandoned or neglected. And looking after one hut or one shed in a big bit of waste grounds is not necessarily a defence against it being neglected or abandoned. It's still neglected or abandoned. So, you know, I think we have to be sensible to these interpretations and circumstances are different. So you, you would accept that there are, there are different... There, there is a differentiation between rural and urban? Well, there's a different... Uh, challenge, you know, because, you know, measuring neglect or abandonment in a, a rural area is potentially, of course, different to the middle of a city centre. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you, convener. Not for the first time, Alec Ferguson is right and has read my mind. I have nothing else to ask. I was good to ask precisely yes. that point, but he put it so much better. <laughs> okay. In that case, we'll uh, swiftly move on uh, to the interpretation of sustainable development. And the key to Parts 3A of the 2003 Act is uh, public interest in furthering the achievement of sustainable development. Um, that being so, um, Cabinet Secretary, the policy justification for the inclusion of the double requirement for community bodies to show that they're furthering the achievement of sustainable development and for ministers to be satisfied that if ownership were to remain in the same hands, that it would be inconsistent with furthering the achievement of sustainable development in relation to the land. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, the, the, the thrust of our land reform legislation is to promote sustainable development, and that is the, the, the motivation for intervention and, of course, the justification for intervention. Therefore, looking at sustainable development, we are proposing to look at two factors, which is whether the new ownership from the community will further sustainable development, and you have to measure that against whether leaving it under current ownership would further sustainable development. So, yes, it's a double test in that sense, but it's a, it's a sensible approach. Um, again, you know, we, we recognise that people are saying perhaps this is just a step too far in a 
it makes it just slightly more difficult for communities. So we will take that on board. Uh, but you know, I think the relatively sensible approaches, because you have to weigh up the both factors. So it is a fact that um, you know there is now some case history for communities that have bought uh, under the existing law. Um, and you know, how has the public interest in sustainable development tests actually uh, been uh, assessed up to this point? Have they been more difficult for communities, or are they not? No, I'm not quite sure I understand the question you're saying in terms of experience of past buyouts, or well, um, there appears to be, uh, you know, a, a problem here. Uh, that uh, you know, the public interest and in sustainable development have been assessed to date, and you know, therefore the impact of these two questions together for existing community right to buy applications that have been approved. Do you think or foresee any difficulties for communities in meeting the, the, these two tests in future? Well, clearly, <coughs> we. We don't see significant difficulties, and that's why we're proposing it in the legislation, because uh, we expect a community to be able to show why taking ownership will further sustainable development. And that clearly is a key criteria for ministers taking decisions as to whether to support it proceeding. Uh, and part of that argument is what is happening with the land or asset at the moment and what contribution it's making to sustainable development. So I, I would hope that that is not presenting additional difficulties. Uh, and clearly, ministers will have to look at what the situation is with the asset at the moment, as well as the proposals from the community. I think that's a sensible approach. Uh, but again, you know, if, 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 as I said before, if, if that's seen as an additional obstacle or um, a hurdle too far, you know, I, I'm keen to hear views on that. Okay. I think Dave, Dave Thompson wants to come yeah. in. Yeah, I mean, I will say that the, this double test is, is in the, the part three of the bill, yep. as it were. So it's only in relation to neglected and abandoned land, not the wider parts two and three. It's only that specific element that that test comes into. Okay. Um, Graham Day has got a point here. So just to follow up with the Cabinet Secretary's point, I mean, some of the evidence we've taken suggested, and I quote, this appears a very high and most probably an impossible hurdle to overcome and unnecessary to meet under ECHR requirements. So we have taken evidence that, that perhaps runs contrary to the point you've made, Cabinet Secretary. So I think we would appreciate you looking at that. Mm. Well, again, you know, I take seriously the views of the committee. That's the, the purpose of the stage one mm. investigation and taking evidence. So if you uh, want to bring forward suggestions to the government, I'll certainly give them serious consideration. I only want to just give the reassurance that in terms of the second part of the test as to whether or not continuing ownership under the current arrangements from the existing owner further sustainable development, clearly ministers will want evidence and proof mm -hmm. from the existing owners. So the community is making the argument that taking over ownership will further sustainable development in terms of buying because of neglect or uh, uh, abandonment. And the existing owner is arguing against that and saying, no, 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 I'm furthering sustainable development. Well, clearly the government would ask and demand for evidence, you know, from mm -hmm. the existing owner who's trying to resist the community having the right to purchase, that, you know, they are taking steps to promote sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And ministers quite clearly are not going to accept just that as a reactionary, you know, statement from the existing owner to try and prevent the community taking over. They want evidence that things are happening, investments being made, there's a plan in the pipeline. People have been commissioned to bring the land out of neglect or abandonment. You know, they'd have to bring forward evidence. Okay, thank you. In terms of, is it about Dave is Thompson, is it? Just a wee bit of clarification on, on that particular point, convener. Uh, well, fair enough. I mean, I want to ask another point about sustainable yeah. development. So, yeah, yeah, on that point, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Cabinet Secretary, when you, when you were explaining the situation there. Uh, but it seems to me that the wording is the other way around because it says if the owner of the land were to remain as its owner, uh, that ownership would be inconsistent with furthering the achievement of sustainable development in relation to the land. It looks as if the onus would be on the applicant to show that the current ownership would be inconsistent. But what you described a minute ago is that the owner would need to show that his con or her 
continued ownership would be consistent. So there's a difference there, there's a difference in emphasis that maybe needs to be looked at. Okay, well, you know, per perhaps uh, th there is, but I think the, the overall point I'm trying to make here is that you have to look at the consequences of ownership continuing under the existing uh, mm -hmm. owner as opposed to the community taking over and what that would mean for sustainable development. In other words, <clears throat> I'm just trying to think of a practical example to, to illustrate the point. Clearly, a community makes an application to purchase neglected or abandoned land, and the argument's made that that's in the interests of sustainable development and the public interest, and that's, that's good. And clearly, the existing owner of the land may suddenly say, well, actually, you know, last month I hired a company to come and build on this land and reinvigorate it, and that would have to be taken into account. But what I'm trying to say is that the government, of course, would ask for evidence, and you know, it wouldn't be a case of simply the owner trying to get out of the community buying it by simply saying, oh no, but I'm going to redevelop it and I'm going to do things in the future. The government would be strict and say, we need evidence. This is already happening, and it's not neglected or abandoned. Um, so uh, you know, it's just to give that comfort that it's not simply, we're not equipping the existing owner to get out of things easily. But sure, just one final follow-up can be enough. Surely. Um, the <clears throat> that additional clause, in a sense, would be unnecessary because to, uh, the, the, the application would already have to show that it furthered the achievement of sustainable development. If the owner can show that his intentions, um, evidenced intentions, are already furthering sustainable de development, then the community application wouldn't have a leg to stand on anyway. What I'm not clear about is why you need the belt and braces of that additional clause, which may well make it impossible for a community, especially if the onus is on the community side. Um, I may take the point, and you know, we'll reflect upon it. All I'm saying is that you, I feel, should at least look at what the situation is with the neglected or abandoned land. And if there are genuine issues there that should be known about, then that should be part of the, the Minister's decision-making process. Uh, in terms of sustainable development, uh, I wonder if the Minister has reflected on the uh, retention of sporting and mineral rights, which are guarded by the Titles and Conditions Act. Because communities may not be able to make the most of their assets without access to those mineral rights. Um, would you consider uh, in this bill uh, or in the land reform bill looking at means to convey access to mineral rights if it was in the interests of sustainable development of that community? And I should add sporting rights as well. <clears throat> Uh, well, that, clearly that's a, an issue not just for this bill, but as you indicate yourself, it's for the wider land reform debate. Uh, I'll reflect on that. Uh, I, I know this is featured in past land reform debates, and I would want to, to revisit the conclusions that were reached then, especially with regard to mineral rights, which are, are all featured in previous debates. Um, so I'd just ask to reflect on that. But the reflection perhaps take into account that the island of Ireland has a very different system of mineral rights uh, organisation, which was passed before um, the Republic was set up, and that indeed, you know, under 19th century legislation, it was organised so that there were mineral licences rather than uh, right, that, rather than ownership rights of uh, the land down to the centre of the earth. It might be something that's well worth looking at in terms of communities' ability to sustainably use their land. Um, I'll give a commitment to look at that, certainly, and clearly there are examples in Scotland of communities owning the sporting rights, in particular in some cases, albeit I know your question is also about mineral rights, which I'll certainly look at. Thank you. Um, I want to move on to some amendments at stage two uh, with regard to the crofting uh, business. Now, this is the second part of this committee's activity and we'll be taking evidence at that stage. But uh, you know, there's been a call for evidence uh, for 
uh, the amendment of Part 3 of the uh, 2003 Act. Um, I wonder if, Cabinet Secretary, you can give uh, any early indication of the level of support for the amendments being proposed by you for, uh, from the responses to the call for evidence. Uh, <clears throat> Clearly, in the early days of this bill, the focus was on part two of the bill and many of the issues we've just been discussing for the last hour and a half. And during our discussions with stakeholders, it was clear there was a desire to use this bill as a vehicle for addressing some of the, the crofting issues arising in part three of the Act. So, having listened to stakeholders, that's why we are proposing to bring forward some amendments in stage two, uh, particularly to try and relieve crofting communities over some of the onerous burdens of mapping, for instance, when it comes to the applications for the uh, purchase of, the, of their estates. Uh, so we are bringing forward those amendments. <clears throat> so far, the feedback from all stakeholders has been very positive and they support what we're doing. So we are encouraged by that and it's still our intention, as I say, to bring forward these amendments at stage two. That's kind of useful because amendments of, to parts two and three A do involve such uh, complex matters as mapping, blanket registrations, re-registration or identifying landowners. Uh, so all of these things uh, will require to be addressed. Um, have we any early indication of any other amendments that might be brought forward at this stage? Uh, well, officials and lawyers are working on drafting up various amendments at the moment for stage two uh, on the, the, this part of the bill. So it's uh, probably wise for me to write back to the committee uh, as soon as I can on that issue. Okay, that sounds very good indeed. Right, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That's good. We've managed to cover quite a lot of the ground here that will help us to make our report. Um, it's been a very interesting session because we can see that it's breaking new ground, that it's an opportunity to actually give communities a better chance to succeed, and uh, we're interested in making a report that reflects the optimism that there seems to be, certainly, around the evidence that we've been given by most people. So thank you very much for your uh, evidence just now, and to Dave Thompson, the official. Um, I suspend for five minutes before we move on to the next item for a comfort break for me.
And um, the third agenda item today is uh, for the committee to consider the public petition PE 01519 by John F. Robbins on behalf of uh, Save Our Seals Fund. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to stop issuing licences permitting salmon farming, salmon netting and salmon angling interests to shoot and kill seals in Scottish waters and instead require the salmon farmers either move their farms into onshore tank systems or legally require marine salmon farmers to install and maintain the high strength, high tension predator exclusion nets they require to meet their legal obligations under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 to protect their stock from the attention of predators. We further ask that the Scottish Parliament ask the Scottish Government to legislate um, to close down all salmon netting stations in Scottish waters, thus allowing tens of thousands of Atlantic salmon and sea trout to return to their native rivers to breed. This is a catch-all discussion about not just seals by the looks of it. So I refer members to the paper and I invite comments from members on the petition and, uh, and seek some agreement about the way forward. Who wants to kick off? Alec Ferguson. I, I'm, I'm happy to make a comment, um, convener. Uh, members will recall that we gave some considerable consideration to this question during our consideration of the Aquaculture Scotland Bill. Um, and uh, I think we all came to the conclusion then that we were basically content while, while, while accepting that there are concerns um, over this issue. I think that my, my recollection is that we were uh, content with what we heard, that the steps being taken by <coughs> sorry, <coughs> aquaculture practitioners were um, as, as robust and, and practical as they could be, um, and that the shooting of seals was only used in, um, in, in extremists. Um, I, I was personally quite satisfied about that, uh, and I'm not sure that continuation of this petition, from our point of view, um, will do anything, anything to resolve the situation. Um, and I, I really can't see any future in us continuing this petition, given, the, given what our considerations during the Aquaculture Bill. OK. Um, other people want to speak? One, two, three... Uh, Graham Day first. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Very briefly, I just I would concur entirely with uh, Alec Ferguson on this. I, I read the evidence that the petitioner gave to the petitions committee. That didn't in any way um, away my concerns about the petition. Um, there was a number of claims made that seemed to be unsubstantiated about the number of, of uh, seals that are being uh, shot. Um, so I, I would tend to agree with Mr Ferguson. Thank you. Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I think given that there are a number of uh, strands to the petition um, which have been, I, I would reckon, uh, properly addressed, I'd be minded to close the petition. Um, I think uh, Marine Scotland has adequately or satisfactorily uh, addressed the issue of, of seal control. Um, the salmon industry is evolving and we're seeing the introduction of increased use of high-tension predator exclusion nets. And we're also seeing the introduction and rolling out of onshore tank systems, uh, as the committee saw when, uh, when we visited uh, Loch Aber. Um, and clearly that's another aspect of the petition, which has a number of strands to it. Uh, the only issue in the petition uh, which hasn't been satisfactorily addressed uh, are the salmon netting stations. Um, however, that's work that the committee still has to do uh, to, to, to look at following the uh, Wild Fisheries Review uh, report. Um, so, given that a fair bit of work's already been done on the issues that are raised in the petition, um, I would be minded to, to close. Okay, Mike Russell. I think there are two questions. One is, you know, the law it does everything, I think, possible to avoid the killing of seals. And is the law being flouted or not observed in any significant way? And I don't think the petitioner has presented any evidence that that is the case. If he has any evidence, then he should not only present it to the, to, to the Parliament, but to the police, because it's an offence so to do. The second question is, should the law be changed? Is there a further change required to protect seals? And that's a legitimate campaign, but it's not the campaign he seems to be pursuing. He seems to be pursuing a campaign based on the law being flouted. Now, if there's no evidence the law is being flouted, he has brought no evidence forward to the law being flouted, then 
I, I think the petition just has to close. But we should bear in mind uh, whether or not the law is being flouted and whether or not a better law can be found as we continue with our work. Anyone else who wants to comment? Uh, Claudia Beamish. Yeah, uh, thank you, convener. Um, I'm, I'm persuaded by the arguments that have been put forward by others that the, this um, petition should be closed. And I would just highlight that we are going to look at the Wild Fisheries Review and that the Aquaculture Bill has regulations, but also that those can be amended as appropriate by ministers. So um, I don't see anything that um, would argue that this petition should be kept open. Thank you for that. Um, if I'm summing up the views of members, I think that we know that the National Marine Plan has a section in it with regard to aquaculture and indeed therefore regarding the nature of uh, predators like seals. Um, that the salmon netting uh, issue will come up in secondary legislation next week and that uh, the Wild Fisheries Review will take considerable evidence shows that we are showing a continued interest in making sure that the question of seals in the natural environment and in terms of man-made structures is taken into account. So if that's the case, can we recommend as a committee that we close this petition and maintain our interest in the matter uh, as suggested? Are we agreed? If, thank you for that. Um, in that case, uh, fut future meetings uh, of the committee. The next week we will be discussing, that is on the 17th of uh, December, uh, an evidence session on the National Marine Plan with the uh, Scottish Government officials and consider its draft budget report on the Finance Committee, if, to the Finance Committee and further work programme. So I now ask the public gallery to be cleared and formally close this meeting.